Moving on to our next talk, I'd like to call on stage Fanish, Amar, and Kiran from Team Flipkart to talk on the great convergence. I guess we've heard a uh, lot about mobile, mobile app development in the last one hour. This actually uh, aligns with what Sachin and Amod were saying this morning. We are very focused on mobile. And the next talk is actually about mobile too. Um, so what is this talk about? Okay. Um, everybody wants apps. Okay, there's no debate or arguing in it. And uh, everybody's installing apps. But the question really is how long can you, like how long can you um, make your customer keep the app on their phone? What is the lifetime value of your app? There are two reasons why, at least we've seen at Flipkart, why people uninstall apps. One is, this app is of no value to me. Second, this app is too slow. I think Chetan and Pratyush did an awesome job of explaining what went behind the screens to, ma to make our app actually perform at scale. So this is actually about um, how, do we, how do we even know what our customers want from our apps? Uh, if you don't know, somebody else is making money. So you better know. But to be honest, let's be honest, guys. We don't have Steve Jobs amidst us. I had to bring it up. So um, what I'm going to do is actually um, I'm going to walk over um, what usually happens in an app development. You want an awesome app. Um, to give to the customers, and then um, you, you want to make sure the user experience on the app uh, with respect to features, with respect to performance, everything um, is in line with what we promise to our customers. And then you make sure your users are actually engaged with the app. I mean, you, you don't want app installed and then users never use the app. It's the same as like people in uninstalling the app. How do you do it? Um, actually, how do you know your app is doing is based on what the user is um, giving feedback as. It can be a direct feedback, it can be an indirect feedback. Um, engineers from mobile team will be talking about how we um, actually uh, finish this circle. They actually put me on stage to say the bad things first, so that's why I'm here, and so that they get to talk about all the good things. So um, when you start doing a mobile app, right? Um, Usually, time to market is one pressure everyone has. We have to get our app out. So we, we go with hybrid views. Like uh, Pratyush said, uh, it's the fastest way to get a hybrid view out there. Um, but depending on the app also, I mean, uh, and then um, you have all the clients to consume the data from the backend servers. Again, kick wrappers around what we have backend. You just put a wrappers around it, you get going at it. And then um, how do you engage the users? You send notifications. And again, there are a lot of solutions out there on the market um, which actually g gives these functionalities out of the box. So you don't have to um, actually invest in it when you're starting with the app. And then uh, how do you collect the data from um, the app? How user is actually behaving on the app and all of those details. Again, there are a lot of third-party solutions available out there on the market. Um, to be honest, I, we also use this. When, when um, we launched the ebook's first version of the app, uh, most of these solutions that you see out there on the right side are what we used. Um, yes, we got the app out, and we were so happy. This is what happened. I don't know if you guys can read it. I'll read it out for you. Not good. It takes a lot of time in searching a book, and you can't search a book with keyword. Worst performance, not able to navigate the contents of the book quickly. See, I'm being honest here. Our app sucked at that time. Uh, too high network usage. It takes great while just to browse. Even Kindle is faster. Okay? So this was a huge learning for us. Okay? Yes, we put out the app, but did we solve the, the purpose? I mean, are we there yet? That is when the reality struck us, and we said, okay, actually, we took 100 steps backwards. It's better off not having a app. That's when um, we decided, let's stick to the basics. And how do we solve this problem? I'm going to now turn over to our engineers from the mobile team, um, who actually represents the, the mobile and the backend team, respectively. Uh, Kiran from our mobile team, Fanish from our backend team. They, um, I'm not saying we solved the problem yet, but we are, we are heading in the right direction. And uh, they're actually going to walk you through what we did and uh, how is app doing now. If, Anybody hasn't installed? Again, this is actually eBooks app uh, because this was the first app we did, and there were so many learnings we leveraged with retail app. So retail app didn't have to see any number in three; they started off with four. Um, so yeah, over to you guys. 
Like I said, they made me tell all the bad things. <laughs> Check. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kiran. <laughs> hey, and people. I'm Fanish. Uh, and yeah, we'll be taking you through the rest of the story. So the number was puzzling, right? You know, you did all the amazing things and used proven solutions that were out there. And 3.5 rating uh, in a game like e-commerce actually is, you know, somebody will be saying you lose, you know, very badly. So, you know, it's puzzling, right? You now you did the right things, selected the right solutions that were out there. Oh, but you ended with the wrong uh, number by the end of it. And people started saying bad things about your app. So, you know, what's this puzzle? You know, how to crack this? You know, uh, you know, you need fluid interfaces, you know? Yeah, so uh, the thing with interface is, uh, I mean, if you, people, when they use mobile apps, they are, uh, you know, they have very less time. They, they don't want to spend too much time with the UI or the, the app itself. And if the interface is not fluid enough, it's not fast enough, or it doesn't look good, then he just quits the app or he uninstalls the app. So one of the main pieces of uh, this problem we were trying to solve was, one, was with the UI. Our UI wasn't smooth enough. That's because, uh, again, it's, the problem lies in HTML5. Uh, the world is not ready for it. The mobile devices are not ready for it. We chose it because everyone said it. Everyone says, go with HTML, but yeah, you cannot get a fluid interface with that. And you have this other big problem, you know, uh, if you stick with an ecosystem, uh, you know, uh, and say I only want to develop an iOS app or a Windows phone app, uh, you know, users will get locked into it or your target audience is quite small. Uh, what typically happens is, you know, when you create an awesome app or an awesome a idea as an app, you want it to be available on all, at least, you know, popular platforms. Now comes the problem of state transitions. You know, what if the user or the customer is using one application on, say, device one, say, an Android phone, and po possibly he gets home and he has an iPad. He opens the same app and we take him to the login screen. How awkward is that? You know, what if we can provide seamless transition, you know, f including states? You know, can't we pick up from where he left off? on the other device. So that's data portability. You know, what if we can actually do something like, you know, automatically transition the data as well that is generated on the phone to the other platform transparently so that the user sees it as not a transition, but just picking up things from where he left off. So uh, all of this is if the user is in the app. Now, typically what happens, someone installs the app, he uses it for some time, and he forgets about it. So the only way to bring him back to the device is push notifications. Now, push notifications, again, you don't want people, I mean, peop, you don't want to spam them with a lot of push notifications, and if it's a really boring push notification, which just opens the app, that's it, that's not going to be interesting. So what we have to think about is much more about push notification, which I'll come to a in, in a little while. And then the last piece in the puzzle is feedback. You know, yeah, you know, bad feedback, very few listen to it. You know, nobody wants to hear a bad feedback. But uh, great lessons can be learned by doing that. You know, we can proactively ask for feedback. Or what if we ingrain that capability inside the app itself to collect use usage, be usage or behaviors of a particular user? You know, what if you can automatically detect a particular crash or sluggish performance on a particular class of device without even actually bothering to ask the user, you know. Uh, so with this, you know, uh, you can actually get great insights into uh, where your app is performing better, where you need to focus on, and as well, like, you know, where to correct problems before they can occur when you release the app next time. Because, you know, if you look at it, you know, once your app is out, millions of users are going to install it. and if there's a very critical bug, it's extremely hard because the distribution channel is there, but it's very, very difficult to get all the million users updated instantaneously. Whoever is stuck with the problem will get stuck with the problem for some time. So you need to have you know, feedback mechanisms which will alert you long before this happens and also gives you insights into where you need to improve user behavior, you know, user interactions, where to improve performance, where to stop errors from happening or transparently handle that. So this is the ecosystem. You know, uh, Chetan actually gave a glimpse of how 
the retail ecosystem looks. Uh, this is in general the ecosystem that uh, you know the ebook uh, you know delivery system uses or the ebook app uses, as well as uh, the slash and app. You know, uh, let me kind of ask this very awkward question: How many of you have installed the slash and app? Ooh. Wow. Okay. Nice. <laughs> nice. So uh, if you really want to know, it took 10 to 14 days to develop this app because we already had a great ecosystem behind it. We had to just, and we had great learnings from the ebook app. So we just had to use that, apply it, and build this very simple you know, app which just works out of the box. So, uh, 10 you know, to 14 days with two developers? Yeah, 14, de 14 days with two developers on two platforms. Okay, so that's what it took. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> midnight, burning the midnight oil is implied, okay? So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, first piece of the puzzle. Yeah, so, uh, we had, I mean, we had a bad experience with HTML. So, at the other alternatives there uh, was frameworks like Titanium, PhoneGap, or a WebView-based approach, which still wouldn't solve the problem of having a really optimized rendering experience on uh, a small screen device. So, uh, what we did was we went back to the basics. We implemented each and everything from scratch uh, using native views. So. Uh, what, what we took care this time was that the native views appear on all of the screens uh, perfectly well. And uh, in, uh, we also made, made use of a lot of gestures to you know, speed up things. Uh, thanks to Google for providing a lot of uh, uh, good open source libraries when it comes to views. Things like ViewPager, excellent, awesome job by them. So we started using them so that uh, you could re reach any part of the app just with a flick of your finger. And yeah, um, so yeah, summary was, yeah, uh, all of it was native uh, views. We completely avoided hybrid views. What do you right. So the next problem, right, you know, uh, having existing, you know, most of the companies are not mobile first. You know, they start out, of, out in web, and then they start developing mobile apps. So when you start doing a mobile app, the Kind of, you know, uh, your sense says, you know what, I already have web APIs. I'll just reuse them. I'll not rebuild or do anything with it. You know, it's time consuming. They are all APIs, anyways. Uh, but you'll be terribly wrong. You know, when it comes to mobile devices, Chetan pointed out clearly you can be on a 2G network or a 3G network. And believe it or not, this place is an example of how mobile networks can go horribly wrong. Uh, I don't think anybody has a 3G or, you know, HPA network here. So, how to make things work with patchy connections? You know, your normal web APIs are not used to it. You know, on desktops, you assume that you have extremely consistent connections, bigger bandwidth. So, you usually, like, you know, do not really pay attention towards payloads, data structures that get, you know, trans you know uh, transferred over the wire, etc. So, but in mobile, every byte counts. So, what you need is a leaner set of APIs that are extremely performant because as uh, Kiran pointed out, perceived performance, right, that really matters. It's okay to, f you know, kind of have a millisecond delay in rendering the view, but if he sees the waiting symbol for one and a half minutes to just download the entire data packet that you sent from the server, you've already lost it. So you need very lean, extremely performant, low latency APIs. So a different gateway which enables you to do that will help you a lot in getting a performant app out. Yes, so uh, so you spoke about building the uh, API very well. He, uh, so what we did on the app side was, uh, with every version of the app, as we build more and more features to it, what happens naturally, the payload keeps increasing or, or the payload size from the server keeps changing. So this gateway API also supports versioning of the app, and depending on the client's version, uh, we get a smaller size or a bigger size of the payload uh, uh, depending on the features Im implemented in that version of the app. So one of the things was to minimize the, uh, the calls to the API. And yeah, uh, again, uh, excellent work by Google on the Wally -E, uh, library, which provides us very good uh, caching and retrying mechanisms. And to combined with the smaller payload from the API, that naturally becomes faster. We need to speed up. Uh, yeah. So you know, Chetan gave a uh, very good you know oversight into you know how 
push notifications work. Uh, the system is called Flipcast. So you know, if you use third-party services that are out there, not a lot of control is with you. You know, uh, can you implement you know targeted multicast? Say you want to send a bulk notification to a set of users. You know, it's extremely hard to think of services like that unless you want extreme. Uh, you know engagement levels. You know it's easy to send a boring you know uh, push notification says you know here is 10% discount offer. But you know what if you want to send it for a particular set of users who are on a particular set of devices, say a Samsung Galaxy you know three or Samsung Galaxy S or something like that. So we have developed that capability in house to do that, and we have implemented a lot of mechanisms to keep it very transparent. You know it's very annoying to make various different calls. On vari for various different platforms, because Apple has different restrictions, you know, Google has different ones, Microsoft says something else. So how to keep the payloads transparent, right? So this service provides that. And even the retail app uses this service to send millions of notifications on any given day. So we are short of time, so I'll go a little faster. So uh, uh, when we used Flipcast, API uh, provided uh, by our in-house uh, service. We also made sure that uh, they're context-sensitive push notifications. So you can reach any part of the app, and the server decides what this push notification leads you to. So every, every screen has a unique ID, and you can reach that particular screen when the user clicks on it, when the, uh, that's decided based on the payload. All right. And you know, I'll just click twice. So you know, this is the disconnected mode uh, experience. Okay, so not a lot of times user will be online. You know, what if you know he takes the data connection off and he switches it on only when he reaches home, and so that you know when there is a Wi-Fi network available. How do you create that disconnected mode experience? Offline experience is different, and completely disconnected mode is different. You know, offline is making certain resources available so that your app does not look broken. But disconnected mode is assuming that there is no network connection and maintaining the experience that an app provides just like it's online. So we have an in-house you know, service again, which works at mobile scale. It's called FlipSync. Uh, just works like iCloud, you know, syncs, user-generated content, or any content that we want to push across platforms and even web. Uh, you know, ebook has a web reader. The data is synced to web reader as well, because web reader supports offline mode or disconnected mode. You can just download the book. Go offline, read it up, do bookmarks, notes, everything. When you go online, it's automatically synced. And if you open the same book on any device, you know, Android or iOS, those bookmarks, notes, everything is available to you automatically. Yeah. So you know, next thing is user feedback, right? You know, I talked about you know proactive feedback where you explicitly ask the user, you know, how you're feeling about this app. Uh, it can be done. But you know, what if you have a lot of more capabilities which you can ingrain into your app, which sends usage information, you know, crash information, or you know, even you know, latency information or performance information to an uh, analytic service where we can get deep insight as well as trends. Okay, so you know, but that will help you to improve your app, and you know, try, you know, you can focus on the areas that you really want. So you know, that's the thing. And post convergence, here is what we have. Uh, you can look at the rating. It's nearing featured category. Anything greater than 4.3, you can very well say, you know, we'll get featured. And good things about the app, you know, we hear bad things as well uh, when things go wrong uh, with our backend services when certain outages are there. But about the app, people say good things. You know, this app has all the necessary features and it's very lightweight. I like the performance of the app. And some somebody and this is a very good thing to hear. Okay, I'm a first-time buyer. And I love this app. Thank you, Flipkart. So these are things that you know we hear from our users. We started hearing from our users after we made this transformation and created an ecosystem just for mobile apps. And you know uh, we can. I, I'll you know. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, so I'm, I'm actually I've been trying to stop these guys because we've run out of time. Yeah. Uh, this actually shows how much work these guys put into this to make this happen. I mean they're not stopping. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Guys, actually, uh, there was a lot of things we wanted to show. Uh, it was actually a 15-minute thing was not enough money. <laughs> um, so uh, these guys will be available off stage. You can ask any questions. Yeah. Slash and app was actually developed for this reason. We wanted to show the functionality of what the backend we built and how soon you can actually build a quick, uh, easy app to use uh, with if you have the right system behind the screens. So in a way, that, that's what we actually call the great conversion. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
thanks a ton, guys. And so sorry about giving you all a 15-minute slot. <laughs> <laughs>